the, the topic of today's workshop is the introduction to Python. It looks like a very basic level talk, but in the end, I will get even Amazon cloud computing, depending on how, how far we can go. Okay. So my name is Bin Chen. I work for the Research Computing Center. It's just the other side of this building, the first floor. Okay. So here is the outline uh, about today's talk. So motivation, so why learn Python or why choose Python? This look like a three pages, three pages thing, but it will be longer than you expect it, okay? Also, since I work for the Research Computing Center, I will introduce the Python resources at the RCC. You will find the RCC useful when your project is bigger than what your laptop can accommodate later on. And, uh, the, the real hard part for me, and for you guys, is probably the basics of Python part. I will have to do coding, but uh, as I told you guys earlier, I will try to reduce the time of coding, because I believe you can find uh, similar stuff anywhere on the internet. Okay, I will talk a little bit about uh, how to use Python packages, but we will not spend too much time on it too. And I, I will also talk about how to develop a application, a real world application using Python. Then if we are lucky enough, we still have time, I will show you how to run, send an application to the Amazon cloud computing. Okay? Depends on how much time we have. So why Python? So here is a list of some popular programming languages. For example, Fortran, C, C++, C Sharp, Java, Golang, Swift. Pretty popular. If you are a scripting person, you see Bash, Perl, PHP, Python, Ruby, and R, R in particular for data science people, okay? And uh, if you are a web programmer, you know JavaScript, Node.js, Scala, .NET, that's for Windows Server. And the Clojure, Haskell, Erlang, they are for the functional programming languages, okay? So now, if so, if there are so many options, then why Python? So why choose Python? Think about it if you are new to the programming world. See, if you have to say, I have to learn some programming language. That's one decision to make, hard decision. The next one, which one shall I take? Okay, so there are so many of them. If you, if you, if you uh, look at the programming language pages on Wikipedia, they actually sorted by letters from A to Z. Each letter have quite many, so there are like thousands of programming languages. Then why choose Python? So first, the Python is easy to learn, okay? Compare with C, C++, or Java. See, if you want to get a good understanding of C or C++, probably you have to sit in some professor's class for one semester, program, program a lot, then you, then you start, oh, oh, maybe I understand a little bit, okay? But the Python is much easier to learn than C, C++, or Fortran. I learned like a C when I was a college student in China. Then when I go to graduate school in the United States, all my professors are using Fortran. Then I basically shifted to Fortran. After later I get this job, I figured out, oh, there are so many other things I can learn. Okay? So the second line is really important for new, for new users. Okay? So Python is loved, really loved by both academia and the industry. That's why it's a good investment of your time. When you, before you decide in future you want to become a professor or you want to go to industry, be a software engineer. So Python is loved by both industry and academia. Okay, so I mean, now I mean, across the university campus, I mean, even the professor in the English department, they are programming in Python. Okay, it's very hard, hard to find some department where there is nobody know Python. Okay, so it is also a general purpose, the glue language. Think about the word glue, means you have a large software packages. It might not be programmed mainly using Python, but maybe some pieces of it are using Python. Okay? Suppose you want a nice graphic user interface, like a front end, maybe it is written by Python. Okay? So it is almost the language for data science in this end of the next decade, and also really used a lot in machine learning and artificial intelligence. 
and uh, it comes with many, many packages by itself. See, when you install Python to your own computer, it comes already with many, many libraries, hundreds of libraries already. That's why that is one motto of the language Python. It, it is batteries included. Okay, it, 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 it has many built-in packages. Okay, it's also scalable. Scalable means, suppose you are running some code on your computer for like a whole day, it's still not finished, then you figure out, can it run it on the supercomputer like RCC? Or can it run it on the Amazon cloud? Can I scale my app to a cluster? Yes. So Python support scalability. Am I making sense? Okay. So why Python? So let's see why industry love it. I think you guys will like. I found this uh, screenshot okay, yesterday from the PayPal developer website. Okay, you can see this is for PayPal REST SDK, Software Development Kit. So what other languages support it? Java, .NET. Java is by Oracle, right? .NET by Microsoft. Node.js, PHP, Python, and Ruby. So Python is on this line, right? This is the thing I, I found yesterday, okay? It's very new. Then how about uh, Amazon? So this is Amazon Web Service, see, AWS, from their official documentation page. So Amazon provided like hundreds of serv services, okay? The thing called the Elastic Beanstalk, that's in the middle, is only just one of them, but a very influential one. So you can see what other language is supported by the Amazon Cloud. So again, Java, PHP, Python, .NET, Node, Ruby, and the Docker. Docker is another thing, okay? We are not going to talk about that uh, today. How about Google? Uh, here is a, again a, scr a screenshot from the Google Cloud Platform, so GCP. So say hello GCP. What are the language supported? You can you can actually find the intersection from the three sets, right? So the Go language was invented by Google. So they put the Go here. Okay, Go is pretty popular, but it's not on the Amazon one or the PayPal one. But you can see. Uh, Python shows up in all the three major leading industry websites, right? So I see, I mean, why it's a good investment of time. So I hope people showed me these three, three pages like uh, at least five years ago. Then at that view, actually lead me myself, like what language you really want to learn, right? Suppose you want to find an Amazon job later in the future, then you, you, you just put like a Fortran or something on your resume then, you know, it's pretty hard to get through the interview based on what, what they put on their website, okay? I'm not saying that those languages are not important, but I'm saying that if you want to go to industry, you better figure out what industry people like, okay? So think about it. So that's why the Y Python section is way longer than you expected, but I think it's more interesting than code itself, okay? So here is a comparison for uh, Python vs Ruby. Ruby show up in all three pages, okay? So, so Ruby has a very influ influential framework in the industry called Rails. Basically, we say like Ruby on Rails. Then like even Java try to duplicate what Ruby did. They have a thing called Grail, okay? And the language called Groovy. And Python has a similar one called Django. This is the logo for Django uh, web framework. So Python via C and C++. I know many faculties uh, programming C and C++ in particular for the high performance computing world because C code and C++ code are the fastest compared with Python. So Python in speed is much slower than C, C++, but with the modern world with super, with super computer and a very fast CPU and a cluster CPU, so the speed at the disadvantage is not that important now. Okay, so also I want to say that Python and C, C++, they are not enemies to each other, okay? So actually, most people, when you are using Python, the Python software itself was written by C, okay? So that's why to, in, to, to wrap your C library into Python is very easy, because Python itself is written by C. For example, the, 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 the very popular uh, AI or, or deep learning package called TensorFlow, it has a front end in Python. So what do you see? The, the graphic user interface was written by Python, but the back end, when it's worrying about speed, it's written in C++. Okay, so we see why I say Python is a glue language, because basically it's used anywhere. 
It might be the whole software, but pieces of it, a part of it, might be written in Python. Okay. I, I want. I do want to uh, uh, point out that Python code usually is like can be. It can be 100 times slower than C C++. We don't worry about it here today because normally it's not as a big issue. Now, so Python VS R for the data science. I know for people doing data science, R is another very promising option. Say, if you have good understanding of linear algebra and a statistic, if you find R language is, is what you really like. And I know for some companies outside, R is almost used like a religion. You have to understand R. Okay? But, but Python is really competing with R now. Okay? Remember, the advantage of Python is Python is really more general purpose than R. You, you use R for data science, but you do not use R to develop a web application or send it to the cloud. Okay? So R is more broad, much more bro broader, much broader than R. Okay? So for, for, for scripting, I know for if you are a Linux system admin, probably you know either you are expert in either Bash or Perl. But, but uh, Python is, getting, is catching up. So more and more Linux system admin is choosing Python instead of Bash or Perl. Because if you, if you write like a one line Bash script, then if you start to get messy, very hard to read. Okay? Even for yourself, after three months you wrote that code, you don't understand what you did. Because the code is hard to understand and memorize. But Python is different. The, the, the coding syntax of Python is very beautiful. Okay? It's enjoyable to read your own code and share your code with other people. Okay. Then, okay, finally, what is Python? Okay. So Python is a scripting language. Scripting means like, it's like you are writing an essay. You do not need a compiler. I mean, compare with C or C++. You write like three or ten lines C code. You think, let's go and run it. No, you have to compile that human-readable code into executable before you can run it, right? You download the thing to your Windows operating system, it's a .exe, that's not a readable file because your original source code, which you can read, has to be compiled into something, then you can run it. But Python is different because you can directly run the script you wrote until the line it crashed. See, suppose you, had, you wrote like a 50 line Python script, there is a bug at like 49 lines. Your code will at least run up to that line you know where you, you crashed. But C and C++ is, first you have to get through the compiler. You have to get your code successfully compiled before you can really see anything. Okay, you can immediately see the output of your Python code by just running it on the, with your Python uh, interpreter. Okay, Python is a dynamically tapped language. Say, I define A equals to one, then that means A is an integer, right? Later on, okay, can I redefine A to be a string, say, hello world? Yes, you can. Then later on, can I replace A to be a list, say, with three numbers, one, two, three? Yes. Dynamically typed means the type of A is not fixed to be an integer or a string or a list. But if you do it in C or C++, you will have huge trouble because first you declare A as an integer. Later on, you think, maybe I want to use A as a floating number, like A equals 2.3. You, you you will get an error because it's not it's static typed. Once you ch once you choose the type of and variable, it is fixed. You cannot change the type anymore. Okay, that is the one thing make coding in Python so much easier than coding in C, C or Java. Okay, Python is also a fully object oriented language. I mean, it's a modern language, not a traditional way. I I'm trying to write a function for sign how to do how to compute this thing. It, it's object-oriented thing based on class. So everything in Python is an object. So it's a modern language, including fe features such as the functional programming and the anon anon anonymous functions like lambda or generators. We are not going to get there today, so don't panic. Python is also a beautiful language, okay? Much better than other scripting languages like Bash, Perl, those stuff, okay? So why I say Python is a beautiful language I mean, for people who, is, who came from C or C++ world, sometimes they look at the Python code, they think that it is pseudo code, they think it is not a real program. And uh, I found this picture from the YouTube, it's like, sorry brother, you are wrong. It's not a pseudo code, it's a real code, it's run, it runs, okay? 
So Python syntax makes people think it is pseudocode, but it's not pseudocode, it's real code. For example, suppose I want to print a, like a hello world in Python. We just say print hello world. This makes people think like this is pseudocode, which you publish in papers to outline your algorithm, right? This is not a pseudocode, this is a real code, okay? But I want to point out if it is Python version 3, we have to put a pair of parentheses around it. But you can see how simple it is. So if we want to do hello world in language C, you do this, okay? First, you have to include the header file because the C itself does not include the library called stdio. You have to include the library, then call the function from that library. So you see, you have to create a main function to surround that thing. So how about C++? Actually did some shortcut. We again have to include some packages, then use the namespace, then do output. Again, we have to write a main function to surround this. Okay, so you can see like uh, how much simpler the code of Python compared with C or C++. Another thing to remember, the, the C code in Hello World and the C++ one, you have to compile it first to generate an executable, then run it. But the Python, you just run Python, that thing. Suppose, suppose I call this thing a.py, I just can run py that thing. I don't have to compile it, then it just works, okay? That's why I say it's a, it's a beautiful language. Now, we, we, are, we are getting to real thing. I hope you guys are happy with what I talked so far. Okay. I, I really don't want to do too much coding today in the afternoon around 4 p.m., okay? So install Python. The good thing is if you are Apple, if you are a Linux user, it comes with Python already. See, if you buy a Linux computer, the Python is installed already on the computer. If you are an Apple computer user, it has a Python too. But for Windows user, actually I do not use Windows. That's why I'm not confident about manip manipulating the desktop here today. So yeah, so I, I Googled online, like does, does Windows come with Python? Actually the first output is why Windows does not in include Python? <laughs> okay, so then I know it's probably not there. Okay, so you, you go to this page, python.org, then download the Windows version, double click the installer, then it will be there. So this, this is the one I want to recommend you guys to install. Uh, Anaconda Python. Anaconda Python is a, is a wrapper around Python. Say so you have, a, it, it contains a Python and with a hundred of extra packages. Okay, suppose you are a new user. Later on, you want to use some packages for your data mining, machine learning, but you don't know how to install those packages, right? So I would suggest you to in install Anaconda Python directly. It contains another like two or three hundred packages already there. So you can immediately start to do your research. Because here are the some example packages provided by the Anaconda Python. For example, uh, Pandas, SciPy, and uh, NumPy, JupyterPython, this, and uh, TensorFlow. These are the same, really hot. See, TensorFlow is the, 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 the one you invented by Google for AI and the deep learning. Okay, so when you install this version of Python, these packages come with you directly. A bigger issue is uh, Python 2 or Python 3. Okay, here is the thing you want to pay attention to. There are two major versions of Python, Python 2 and Python 3. Now the question is like, which one should I start to use? So if you are a totally new user, I would say definitely start with Python 3, if you are, if you are a new user. And uh, the support to Python 2 actually will formally stop around 2020. Okay, this look like uh, I shouldn't really think about Python 2. You might think like this. Why, why even worry about Python 2 when the industry is going to abandon Python 2? And what I'm trying to say is the community is trying to convince people to shift from Python 2 to Python 3 for over a decade. This endeavor is actually a fiasco. Okay, they failed like very badly. Even now there are still many, many, many software written in Python. Yesterday when I logged on the PayPal website trying to see their, their Python documentation, sorry, it's still written in Python 2. Okay, so these, these claims if you stop the support in 2020, now it's 2019 already, okay? I don't think they will finish it that quickly. So if you are like an ambitious user, you, uh, uh, Python user want to find a software engineer job, probably you want to learn both because maybe the first job you, you are asked to do is update some software package from Python 2 to Python 3. If you start with Python 3, have zero knowledge about Python 2, you will have huge trouble in, in your future work. Okay, and the difference between Python 2 and Python 3 itself was like hours lectures. If I can finish the story in one hour, 
probably it won't take like more than 10 years for the industry to shift it, but still failed. Okay, so it, there are many, many subtle differences between Python, Python 2 and Python 3. I would encourage you to in, in install a version of each into your computer. So if you are Python 2, do at least the 2.7. You see I put a red on 2.6, okay? You want to, if you are one, uh, if you use Python 3, do it at least the 3.4. I'm using the math notation for the inclusion or non-inclusion boundary or the interval, okay? So Python resources at the Research Computing Center. So it, like a little advertisement for us. So we have both Python 2 and Python 3 available, okay? So we have Python 2.7.5, and Python 3.7.9. We also have two versions of Anaconda installed already. So Anaconda uh, kept 2.7.15 and Python 3.6.5. This one, why we install this one? Because for example, the GPU version of the TensorFlow by Google, right now you try to install it on Python 3.7, actually there, there are some issues, okay, it fails. So this one comes with, I uh, installed together the TensorFlow GPU version for the Anaconda 3, okay. So we loaded the module before we use it because there are so many versions of Python, you have to figure out which one you are using, right? So I do a module load Python 3, this, this will use uh, this guy. If I do a module load Anaconda 3.6.5, I'm using this version of Python, okay? Then the question is when to use RCC for Python? Say you already, I know everybody probably have a laptop now, but if you are running a Python job for over two hours, probably your computer will start to heat up, right? It, it, it's that time you think, Maybe I want to run my computer, run my Python job on the cluster, then I can use my computer to watch videos and do other things, right? When your, when your Python job is getting bigger than what you want to do it on your own computer, you should try to run your job on the cluster. We have many free computers for you to use. You just need to figure out how to use them. Right? You can use your own, your own computer, watch YouTube, instead of like running Python jobs for hours, get your computer burned. So here is a show something of a few points. If I, if I want to use Python Anaconda 3, I do a module load Anaconda 3. If I want to use Anaconda 2, I do a module load Python 2. After that, I, was, uh, I see the prompt for Python. You see Python 3.6, Python 2.7. I want to see some difference. I want you guys to see some difference between Python 2 and Python 3. I do a 13 divided by 3. For, for Python 3, what did you get? You get a float. 4.333, right? But if I do a 13 divided by 3 on Python 2, I get a 4. Okay, you can see how subtle the difference between Python 2 and Python 3 can be. See, I'm dividing two integers. For one of them, I get an integer. For another one, I get a float. You can see like uh, there might be a bug, not really a bug in your Python 2 code. When you try to up update your software to, from Python 2 to Python 3, just because of this single line, which you never seen, the output will be different. Your code might crash forever. You don't know what's going on. Do you agree with me on this? 13 divided by three, you get a different output on Python 2 and Python 3. This, you can see how severe the, the challenge it is if you want to shift from Python 2 to Python 3. There are many, many subtle differences, okay? So Python version for today's workshop, okay? You log in with the FSU credentials and choose the scientific computing one, okay? You search for Python. I, could, I do not use uh, Windows, but in the, in, the, in, the, in the bottom left corner, like a program region, you can search for Python. You will find uh, either a python.exe or python IDE. Okay, I would prefer you use this one. This one is more user-friendly, like with a small window, you can type a few lines of code. And the Python version is 2.7.1. From my point of view, it's a little old, but it is fine, doesn't really matter. If I'm using 2.6, I would definitely say, uh, just burn this computer, <laughs> okay? 2.7 is good enough, okay? An another thing, you, you don't really have to type code with me. This is not a lab session, okay? If, if you like uh, feeling sleepy, type code a little bit, make you wake up a little bit. That's why I'm taking notes whenever I go to math class because I feel sleepy if I don't take notes, right? So you, you can type code a little bit if you want to, okay? But you don't have to, if you feel, if you, feel you are awake enough, you, you want to pay more attention to what I'm saying instead of what I'm, typing, what I'm typing, then you don't have to, okay? So, I'm going to talk about the basics of Python. That means we are going to uh, program a little bit. So I will do a little bit about uh, variables, numbers, interflow strings, and basic operators. 
and the data structures, list, tuples, and dictionaries, and the control structures, if, else, how, for loop, and the functions, classes. Classes are not covered today. So I don't know how long this is going to take, because I do want to try to run the web application later on using Python. So if I really feel like the time is running out, I will just stop. OK? So I, will, I might have stopped earlier in, in the coding part if I feel like we don't have enough time left. But if we finished earlier, great. We just go home earlier. Okay. There is no binding that I have to talk like one hour and 30 minutes. OK. You will have all those code. I, I, I did a screenshot for all those code I typed in the slide. If you are interested later on, you, when you download the slide, you, have, you will see all those code I'm going to type. OK. So don't worry too much about the coding. Is the font size bigger enough? Is the font bigger enough? You can see clearly I'm using Anaconda Python, right? 2.7.15, that's the version, right? OK. So let's do a. Uh, You can try to follow me if you can. If you found the Python interpreter on your computer, you do can type with me. But if, if, if you don't don't want to bother, it is fine. Okay. So this sign, the sharp sign, is a comment. Okay. This is a comment line. Okay. Nothing will be printed. Nothing will be done. So this is a comment. So let's do a equals to one plus two. So I'm adding number two to number one and assign the output to, v to A, right? Integer, right? Python is smart enough to guess the type of the variable input. That's why it is a dynamically typed language, right? So now A equals to I changed the type of A to a float. Here is the first lesson I want you to learn. Python is a dynamically typed language, OK? It goes to a string now. Now I'm going to do a little bit of very simple mathematics. Print 1 plus 1. You get this. And 1 mi minus 1. Nothing special, right? And uh, 4 times 3. This is the multiplication. And, uh, 13 divided by 3. This is division. I said, if you get a different thing, if you're running on Python 3, you get a floating number, 4.333 for Python 3. And the modulus operator, this gets the remainder of the division. Right? And uh, this is another one. This will really give you an integer. Either Python 2 or Python 3, you will get an integer for this one. But for this one, you get a different output depending on the version of Python. I hope I emphasized this point uh, enough. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about string. S is a string. I am a string. T equals to I am also a string. Now, why you have to type? You might ask me why you want to type two similar thing. I'm going to do a good thing here. S plus T. This is not the one plus two. This is a string plus another string. I'm a string. I'm also a string. You can concatenate two strings very nicely this way. No, 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 no burden, right? I just add them. They just give me a concatenated string. Very nice. Okay. So suppose I want to figure out, say, what's the first character? What's the first character of this string? This uh, square bracket pair, we call it the indexing operator. S0 give me i. I am a string, the i from i am. The index starting from 0. OK? What they either list, array, tuples, the indexing always starting from 0 instead of 1. OK? If you are a MATLAB programmer, MATLAB 
the index start from one. That is a very, the index starting from one is the reason many scientists hate MATLAB, simply because the index starting from one. Okay? Remember this fact. So how do I get the last character of this string? I am a string. Neither one, the last letter is G, right? Minus one means starting from the last one. If you are good at the mathematics, think about the modular operator, you know the designer of Python is really good at math. Okay? So how, how do I get like the first four characters? The first four characters of this string. I can do the, this. I want to get the first four characters. From zero to, five, to four, there are actually five things, right? I always play with kids, like, from zero to four, how many numbers are there? There are actually five numbers, right? But it, uh, it prints out only four, because it's left closed, right open. If you, if you know interval from calculators, you know the, 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 the four is not included. So it prints only the first four characters instead of the first five, okay? You, you, you can see that at index four, it is a space. But when I print the S square, bra uh, square bracket zero column four, that space is not included. So it's, it's left closed, right open, which is good for mathematicians because when you want a union to intervals, this will make your life much easier because you won't double count the thing at the boundary, right? So I can also do this. For the first four characters, I can do this. I can even skip the first index. I, I can even drop the zero from the first, uh, uh, before the colon, okay? So now I want to duplicate a string. Say hello. I want to say hello like uh, one more time because the guy just didn't listen to me, okay? Then I do this, okay? Very simple, okay? Hello, time is 100. Why you didn't listen to me, okay? So you can see like Python is really a beautiful language. Agreed? It's so powerful. Do whatever. Okay. I have like, a, I am a string. Now, how do I figure out if I am, the, the English word am is inside the string. See, is am inside the sentence? True. This is not a pseudocode again. I am, is this word in string? The answer is true. I don't think in other language you have this really beautiful, compact syntax. Just like without even one extra word, the author does not want to speed one more word needed for express his goal. Right? Agreed? I am in that string. String formatting. Suppose you are writing an email to your students or your advisors, but you don't want to write the email over and over again. So what you do is you create a template but with a few variables where you can insert the name of the professor and the, the name of your re recipient. Right? That's what I mean, a template. Because a template has some variable later on you want to change, right? So let's do this. So something is something years old. I want to replace that two things. There is a magic person sign, okay? So John Doe is 25 years old. So for, for the first placeholder, I want to put a string here, so I use letter S. For the second one, I want to put an integer there, so I put a letter D. D means digit. I, I can get this. This is the way how those spammers created so many emails to so many different, each of them with a different name, right? Make it look like unique, but they are doing trick like this, okay? Another way is, uh, Sorry. Again, yeah, just uh, what is that? Sorry, I close to 4 p.m., okay? John Doe is 25 years old. I have curly, curly braces with zero and one means which one you want to do. Suppose I, I messed up, I, I switched the order, I do a one. 25 is John years old, which doesn't make sense. But, but you can see the second expression is more flexible. 
than the first one. Because you might want to use something several times. Say, I have only two things within that format parentheses, but I want to use one or thing a few times. You just figure out where is that thing and, and put that one several times. See? Uh, this is what I mean. You can repeat the thing. In particular, for if you are like a HTML programmer, you want to put a tag paragraph and end another tag paragraph. This will show up over and over again. This is the trick you do, okay? Because this is even more, okay. Same thing, but a different way. Very flexible. Okay. Okay, this is actually getting deeper and deeper. Okay, so in the last example, I have put the, the curly braces here, age 25, name, John Doe. This looks like what you retrieve from your database. Say you have a, or even Excel file, a column, different column have different thing, right? I get one row that thing, it, a person has the age, has the name. So how, how would I insert that data into my template? I can do it like this way. I just use the same name here, Name, match to that name, age match to that age. This is like, a, there are two asterisks there, which plays a metric. Asterisk is like, a, the, the double asterisk is how I spread, spread a dictionary, like what we did earlier. See, this is easier, but uh, by spreading, by the double asterisk thing, I'm, I'm like uh, converting that uh, curly braces thing in, in, into that age equals to 25, name equals to John Doe. Don't worry too much because you just want to know how broad Python is, but you don't have to memorize anything. Okay. Relation operator. This should be, this should be easy. Okay. One less than two, makes sense, right? And uh, two times three is not equal to the exclamation symbol and uh, equal. This means not equal. Okay. Two. Okay. So on the left, um, 2 times 3 is 6. On the right-hand side, 2 raised to power 3. They, they, sh they shouldn't be different. They shouldn't be the same, right? I can also use a hello. Equals to. Remember, the plus sign can be used to concatenate 2 string. Also, I want to pay attention to this double equal. Double equal, you are comparing two things. A single equal, you are assigning something to something. Say, when I do a equals to one, I'm not compare if a equals to one. I'm going to assign the value of one to a. Later on, I want to compare a equals to two. No, because a equals to one. This is a comparison, but this one is an assignment operator. I'm doing assignment, okay? Okay, do you guys want to ask me anything? Oh, well, I'm totally confused already. Then we just move on, okay? I will try to reduce the, the length of this section because I, I, do, I really don't think it's good to code in the afternoon around 4 p.m., okay? So I have a list, capital L means list, okay? One, two, three, four, has four elements. So suppose I want to add another element. I use the method called L append. Five. Now, what is L? You see, there is a, another new element at the end of the list. Say, I want to figure out where the number three is sitting inside of the list. Say, what's the index 
all the number three inside this list. List I can do L index three. It tells you two. Remember the index starts from zero. I, I think I've emphasized this enough. And uh, suppose I want to slice this list again, like I slice an array, sorry, a string. I can do zero, two. This is the way I'm slicing. I get a little piece of the list. <laughs> similar, very similar to string, okay? This shows the last uh, item, the last entries of the list. If I do this, actually, I only get the, the one next to the last. Remember, it's always closed on the left-hand side, open on the right-hand side. It's the, it's the interval in, in mathematics. Half open, half closed interval. OK? Yes? Yes, yes. L, insert, where, this is the syntax, okay? Where you want to insert something. Suppose that I want to insert at the very beginning. I, I want to even insert a string. Make sense? Let, let me insert another one. It's, it's a very good question. Is it clear? It's a very beautiful language, okay? Tuple. My English isn't good, so I, I want to type that same word. Tuple, T-U-P-L-E, tuple, okay? Tuple is defined using this, not square bracket. List use square brackets, but uh, tuple use just the parentheses. Okay, T. You get an error because what's the last index? The tuple has three elements, right? The last index is actually two. So when I try to index this with three, I get an error because it's out of range. Similar thing will happen for list. Okay. So now a more strange thing is can I replace the first element by a different one? See right now t0 equals to two. Maybe I want t0 equals to 2.5. It will tell me tuple object does not support atom assignment. So this is a very important thing for your future job interview, okay? Tuple is uh, immutable. Say, once you define a tuple, you cannot change it anymore. You cannot add element, insert element, or delete element anymore. It's fixed. List is different. I can append element to it. I can insert element to it. I can even try to remove it. But the tuple is uh, fixed. It's, once you define it, you cannot change it anymore. So this is an important entry-level Python job interview question. So remember, okay? Dictionary. I think I showed dic dictionary already, like uh, the name age thing. I defined a dictionary using curly braces. I think I, we did a very similar thing before. John Doe is so famous. I mean, I never figured out who is that guy. It just show up everywhere. In all those programming language. Okay, so this is a dictionary. What is a dictionary? Dictionary is a collection of key value pairs. Okay, so name is a key. John Doe is the value. Age is another key. Job is another key. 25 and software engineer, the other values. Okay. This guy has a, it shows all the keys, okay? This shows all the values. Okay. Now there are only three keys. Suppose I want to add John's salary. How do I do that? Okay. His salary is 3,000. Okay, cannot be more than me. Okay, so is it clear? Very, very simple, elegant syntax. I use the letter DEL, the keyword DEL, to remove 
the salary key value pair from that dictionary. Now I have only three keys left. DEL, you can use it to delete, remove a key value pair from my dictionary. Okay? D dot atom. So D dot atoms, it returns a list. A list of what? A list of tuples. Each tuple has two elements. Job, software engineer, that is one tuple. Age 25, another tuple. Name John Doe, that's another tuple. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about iteration. For I in 0, 2, 3. I'm writing a for loop. Uh, pay attention to here. I put a colon here. The colon means I'm going to start an indented code block. You see the colon here. I'm going to start a new line, but I'm not going to start from the first character. I'm going to put a tab key. Okay, print i. This is my for loop. I start the for loop with a colon, then starting from the next line, I have to indent a little bit. How much you want to indent is up to you. But if they are within the same code block, then they should be indented in the same way. Also, I want you to keep in mind that space key and a tab key, they are different. You might think I type space key four times, that it might equal to a tab key. It's not true. Tab key and space are totally different in Python. Sometimes they look like the same, they are indented at the same level. But the first line was indented using the tab key. The next line was indented using a few space key. They are different. Your code will crash. Okay? Remember. So for i in, I can, this is a tuple, right? If I want to do it, really want to do it in the same line, I can do it this way. But once you start a new line, you have to indent it. This only works for one line thing. If your, if your for loop have more than one line, you probably want to start a new line, indent, indent your whole code block. Okay, now the question, I have to show you a dictionary. Then how do I iterate through that dictionary? Say John Doe, name, salary, job title. How do I iterate through that dictionary? Remember, I have to indent it a little bit. Print. I'm going to use the string formatting. Job, software engineer, age, 25, name, John Doe, okay? I printed the, code, the, the, the key first, then use the equal arrow sign, then the value. If else, control statement, okay? Yes? Which one? This one? Yeah. Yes. Um, can't you make it like for i and 0 to 4? 0 to 4. What do you mean? You want to print a, another? Yeah, Yes. That's a good question. Is that what you want? Yeah, so then when you only do range, it's going to start you from zero. But yes. You want it from like two to five or something. I could, don't quite remember. It, uh, it, it should be something. You, you got me, okay? It should, I, I'm not sure, okay? It should be like uh, uh, starting from one. Two four. Let's see. Ah. Is that what we want? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I was about to do a for, uh, if else. So h equals to seventeen. If h bigger than eighteen, I want to start an indented block. So I know that I, where I use the colon. Okay. I have to indent it. Print. L if. Okay. That's the if-else block, okay? Clear? 
a while loop. A minus equals to one. This is a little compact syntax. Probably do it this way. Okay. So I start a equal to ten. While a bigger than zero, I print it out, then reduce the a by one. Clearly, the, 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 the while loop will stop when a goes to zero. So you see, ten, nine, and to one. Okay. Okay. I'm defining the function. Okay. Print. Again, I have to use the colon to signify that I, I'm going to start an indented code block. After I define the function, define the function does not mean that you are going to run the function. So it, it did not produce anything. If I want to run the function, now I do a function to this. The advantage of function is you can use it over and over again. Right? You put a code snippet inside a function, then later on you can just call that function for multiple times, as many times as you want. That's why a function is useful, because you can use it uh, over and over again. This function has no input parameters, so it's not that useful, not that interesting. This time, I w the previous function just prints something, but does not return anything. This one, I, want to, I wanted to return plus b. Okay? Function 2, add b to a, and return the result. Right? It's like an adding function. Written, rewritten in Python. So why, why write such a boring function? You will see why I want to do this. It gives you five. Isn't that beautiful? So I read like a function to add A to B, but I don't tell you what is A and what is B, right? If I put two integers, it adds the two integers. If I put two lists, it actually is smart enough to concatenate two lists, give me a longer list. So this is called operator overloading in the language of C++ or Java. You can see like Python has all those fancy features, and it's, imply, it's, it's implemented in a, in a very beautiful way. Similarly, I can define the define function 3. A times B, then I do a function 3 call. This gives you 12, nothing to surprise. This is called a list replication. I want to replicate the list with three elements by four times. Okay, if I want to do this, I get a matrix with four rows and three columns. Right? You mean add two arrays, element by element. This won't do it. Then later on, you find a package called NumPy. Do that thing there. They do all the vector and the vector algebra and the linear algebra for you. Okay. This won't do it element wise. Okay. This just connect two things together. He means like uh, how do I have like a one, two, three, plus like a one, two, three. You get like a two, four, six. This is not that function. Uh, the purpose, okay? But the, later on, you can use NumPy, SciPy to realize all those uh, linear algebra stuff very easily. We are not going to do that today, okay? One more. It's almost four, right? I have to be. I will skip something, okay? You see, there is a magic asterisk here. So we want to see what does this mean, okay? Let me simplify the code because I don't want to do too much. I 
I hope I have the correct syntax. Okay, good, good. So I'm adding one to two here. There's nothing special, but how about this? I can put as many input arguments as I want. This is called, a, I think in C++, it's called a variadic argument. Let me write it down, V-A-R-I-A-D-I-C. My English really isn't that good, okay? This means a variadic argument. So I can create a function which take as many arguments as you need, okay? So I used that magic asterisk symbol, okay? This will fail, but if I use that magic symbol again, this like a, is called a list spread, like a one asterisk put on the shoes, the, another asterisk put off the shoes. Think about uh, what does it mean, okay? I don't want to. Okay, I don't want to do really, I don't really want to spend too much time doing, uh, doing this thing, okay? I want to skip a little bit, then we move on, move back. Uh, I'll get happy with, so far with what we have doing in the coding thing, because I want to talk about more interesting thing instead of spending the whole hour typing code. I actually do not know how much time I've used. That's why I think I want to stop a little bit. You will have all this code which I typed, but in a very nice format. If you, if you are interested, you want to download the, I skipped a little bit for function four. You can see I simplified the logic, and as I'm not going to talk about uh, function five, okay? So Python packages, libraries or modules. So why use packages? There are so many packages come with Python. That's why it makes your life easier. So for natural science, we have NumPy, SciPy, even for astronomers, AstroPy. If you want to plot something, you use the famous matplotlib and the Jupyter thing. I remember when I was trying to publish my first paper in physical review, I used the Mathematica to draw some plot. Then I got quite humiliated by the referee saying that the plot is so pro quality. Then later I, I, I used <laughs> matplotlib, okay? And the Jupyter is another thing. For data science, we do pandas, scikit learn for machine learning, Keras, Torch, TensorFlow, TensorFlow GPU, these are for machine learning. And for image processing, for, for example, Pillow. For web scripting, uh, there are request library and the beautiful soup library. Beautiful soup is really good for web scripting. Okay, if you are interested in this part, remember the name of this package. And for web application, we have Django, Flask, and a Pyramid, probably the top three things. So Python packages, where do you find the packages you want to use? There's a website called pypy.org, means the Python package index. You can find all those packages you want from this website. You use your package using the pip, install the name of the package. Suppose I want to install a package called a Flask. I do a pip, install Flask. And there's another important thing called a virtual environment. Why we need a virtual environment? The point is, uh, suppose you have a different project. You have three different projects. Each project requires a set, a bunch of different libraries. Those libraries might overlap, but they, they, they can be all different versions. For this project, I need a NumPy 1.2 version. For the other project, I need a NumPy 1.6 version. Then how, I go, how I'm going to deal with it? If you have just the one Python and the one place you store your packages, they will conflict each other. So that's why we need a virtual environment where you put all those packages you needed for the specific project into a specific directory, then they don't hit on each other. Okay, that's why we need a virtual environment. If I get time, we will do it, but I will show you an example, but it's not that important for today. So suppose I, I install a package called Flask, then how am I going to use it? We use the keyword import. Import is like the word use, U-S-E. Import NumPy as MP, because NumPy is five characters, too long, I rename as MP. Suppose NumPy has a variable called pi, that's 3.14, then I can use it. NumPy has a function called sine, also cosine, then I can do my scientific computing like this. Yeah, this is the way we do the, uh, we deal with packages. For the first one, I import it as it is. For the second one, I rename it. For the, for the last one, NumPy has many things there, but I just want to use the thing called sine. So I just go from NumPy import sine, I just import this. 
forget about the other thing, then I do sine 1. 1 is the radian, not a degree, okay? Because 1 degree, the sine is almost 0. You, you get a point of 84, so you know it is the radian. So, NumPy and Matplotlib. I guess like when you guys go to the Python workshop for your own department, there are enough workshop, enough discussion about NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib. I don't really intend to compete with them. So I'm just going to do like a two slide thing. So I import this, this like generator Gaussian distribution with the mean value zero, standard error one, then draw the histogram, see it, does it look like a Gaussian, okay? So I import a random, uh, uh, random library called random, and also import NumPy, and also import the plotting function from the matplotlib. So this line uses random Gauss, which generate a single, a single point from the population with mean zero, standard one, but I want to do it for 10,000 times, okay? This is called the least comprehension. So I don't care the name of the variable, but I just want to replicate produce it for 10,000 times, so I get a long list. After that, I use the NumPy histogram to bin my data. So I have 10,000 data points from minus infinity to plus infinity. I want to bin my data into 20 bins. After that, I can draw the histogram, use the plot. Okay, this is what I got. This is the histo plot. Looks pretty much Gaussian, right? So you can see like uh, how, do you can, how you can do simulation using NumPy and those, those packages, which make your life really easy. You don't want to write this thing in CLC++ plus, plus by hand yourself, okay? Don't do it. You will be too old after you're finished. Okay, APP development using Python. I think if we are lucky, we can finish earlier today. Not many packages, not many slides left, okay? So Python web APP via Flask. So I want to try to build a web server with 10 lines of Python code. So I install a package called Flask. Then from Flask, I import a, a thing called the Flask, capital letter F. Then this is a class. Remember, I skipped the object-oriented part of this lecture. So created, created the instance of this Flask. This is a thing called a de decorator. Don't worry about it. What I'm trying to say is, when you go to the root directory, since the, like the index page of my website, my grid website, when you go to the, the index, index page on my website, I want you to show you Flask app, like build a web app with 10 lines of Python code. And if these are the magic variables of the Python code, keep it, keep it in mind and do a little bit of Google search. I don't want to explain too much. Okay. You can see my web, 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 web app page has only one slide, okay? Sorry, I had a symbol. Okay, this is exactly the same code, right? From Flask, import that thing. This is exactly the same code. The difference is I already installed Flask. Uh, see, I installed several things about the Flask. You can see at least the Flask 1.0 is there. So I have to install the package before I can use that package, right? Now I'm just going to do a Python app. It tells me that uh, my, my web server is running on my own computer with HTTP 127.0.0.1, that means local host, on port 5000, okay? And uh, let's see if it is there. Is that cool? Only 10 lines of, less than 10, li 10, 10 lines of code. You can actually count how many bytes of code there, because the majority of the code is about the web page itself, okay? I have a web server running on my own computer, and with the HTML font, because Flask app is uh, both facing in the, in the header format, and the second line is a paragraph. So in 10 lines of Python code, we are running a web server on my own computer. You can see how powerful Python can be. Uh, forget about it. Control C to kill it. And uh, slide show. I'm here. Okay. So cloud computer. 
So now the idea sounds even more crazy. So how about send that 10-line Python code to the Amazon cloud? Let the whole world see it. Can we do it you know, in today's lecture? I might well fail today, but I, I was successful several times at home. Okay. So what we are going to do is first, we have to create an Amazon developer account. I know many of you guys are shopaholic, like my wife. But here, when I say the developer account, I, I do not mean your Amazon shopping account, where you buy books and buy all kinds of things. It's the developer's account, okay? F serious one. You, 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 you apply for account there, then you get access to key pairs from there. Because I'm going to connect something from my computer to the Amazon cloud. Amazon needed to know who I am, right? That's why you need a developer ID. There is a key pair called, the, there is a public one, so access key ID. There is a secret one. So this is a, the key pair you get as an Amazon developer, not as an Amazon shopper, okay? So where are I going to save this file? I'm going to create a file called uh, uh, confidentials inside my home directory. There is a hidden, fi there is a hidden directory called the .aws. There I have, a, I have a file called this. I only show you the three letters because these are actually the real one. I know the things recorded them. I'm not going to let you guys read what's really in there. But that's what I did, okay? After that, you have to install the Python packages written by Amazon. Say Amazon knows there are many people using Python. So they have a Python package to help you to do this thing. So you, you install that Python package to your own computer. The package for the app I want to do is called AWS EBCLI, Amazon Web Service Elastic Beanstalk CLI. Remember that figure looks like a lady's body with a bunch of languages. That's the Elastic Beanstalk, the official logo, right? I downloaded that, that package. Okay, after that, what are I going to do? The important thing you want to see, even if I write that 10 lines of Python code, I need a flask. How do I tell the cloud server I need the package? Right? You are going to upload that file, that, that 10 line code to Amazon Web Server. But how does Amazon, to be smart enough to know, you need to use Flask? Right? That's why you, you create a file called requirements.txt. This put all those packages needed by your software. You create the text file and save it in the same directory where you have your 10 line Python code. Send that thing to the Amazon cloud. Then Amazon will be smart enough to know, okay, this guy is writing a Python code. There is a requirement.txt. I'm going to install everything in there. Then I'm going to run that guy's code. That's, that's why Amazon is a like $100 billion business. <laughs> okay. the, is, is the picture clear? You wrote the code, but you need some packages. You have to tell Amazon what packages you need. That's why you, you, you create a file called requirement.txt. Then you tell Amazon, install these packages for me. Okay. So, yeah, after that, what are you going to do? This is the essential line. You install this thing, and also you have this uh, key pair saved, saved somewhere in your computer. Then you use EB. EB comes with this thing. After you install this thing, you get this utility. In it, I'm going to create an uh, Amazon Cloud Platform using Python 2.7 instead of Python 3. I, I also want, want, my, want my server to run in the US East. That's probably somewhere in the Virginia. Uh, I'm going to call my app Flask app. After that, I create an environment within that app. Don't worry about the difference between them. I just want to let you know quickly. After this, if I'm lucky, it's supposed to run. If I'm done, I can kill it by terminate. These are just the simple thing. The simple step, but clearly there are a lot of details we have to figure out. But once you figure out how to do it, it's not that difficult. I'm going to create a new directory. Cloud zero is mean where I start. Okay. So I have one file called application.py. That's what we have. That's a 10 line code. Okay. I have another one called require. That's what I want Amazon to install for me. Okay. Let's do an EB init. Uh, dash dash. Sorry, my memory is really bad.
this will take a little while. So the cool thing is from this instant, my, my local test desktop is actually talking very intensively to the Amazon cloud. Okay? You, you see a lot of things print out because there is a dialogue between my computer and the Amazon cloud. Okay? If you take a little while, see it, it's going to create an environment and using the elastic bin stock. And it also uses the Amazon simple storage service as the bucket to store my code. Let's see if, if we are lucky to get it finished today. We are almost done. Okay, so in the meanwhile, do you guys want to ask me something? I just want to see the magic. Can you play with the finance and then try something in theory? How what? Finance. You mean the financial yeah. finance field? Previously, I saw the people doing like a financial science or like even accounting majors. They actually they deal with like a real data, confidential data. Right, they don't need the same like a data mining or whatever, right? But actually, my wife is a graduate student is in the business school. She actually told me that her professor is doing some data mining related stuff. They're actually graduate student. They want to do data mining, even web scripting, using Python. Actually, I was surprised. So because they work in the confidential thing, right? Their data are precious. They cannot make it public. How do you do data mining to do your accounting or financial business? But actually, they do. Okay. For financial business, for example, you can do a similar simulation for like a high frequency stock trade. Say you, you find you download the you get the stock price from Microsoft or uh, Apple. They are they, those are high frequency trades. Say for they can uh, they can be as fine as the granularity or like a, a few nanoseconds. So they have they have transaction buying selling. So you can you can download say what's the what's their transaction record for the previous half an hour. And, and, and predict uh, if the stock price is going, to, going up or going down using your models. Then you can try to make money from this kind of thing. So that, then you can use Python to, to deal with this stuff, to write a code to, to analyze the stock trading data, then try to predict the stock price. It's like one way you can use, one way you can use Python. Still not finished? OK. Let, let's hope we are lucky today. If, if it is not, uh, trust me. OK, good. So OK, application available at uh, test develop. Remember, I call my, I call my environment a test develop, right? So you can see this is a dot .com, the top level domain name, Elastic Beanstalk US East one. That's the region I selected. There's a magic bunch of character, which I don't understand, and the test develop. Is that amazing? This is, uh, this is uh, visible from the whole world. Okay? You can even try it on your computer. It should be visible. Okay? Uh, I think we are almost done. Yeah, the, the last two seconds is actually pretty short, depending on how lucky we are. Okay, here is the summary. I'm almost done. We can go home a little earlier. Here is the summary. The motivation of Python. So why choose Python? Because it's loved by both industry and uh, academia, and because it is easy, and because it is beautiful. Okay, and I tell you the basics of Python and how to use the Python packages. I give you a very quick example using NumPy, SciPy to draw histogram. But there are huge, there are way more things you can explore on your own. And I also show how to do a web programming. I use Flask to create the web server using ten less than 10 lines of Python code. Then I send that APP to the Amazon cloud, again, using the utility created by Amazon and written, again, by Python. So the utility provided by Amazon is written in Python too. Okay? So basically, if you learn, if you understand Python, you can do many, many things. It's a glue language. It basically can do everything. It's not as fast as C and C++, but in the world of supercomputing with huge clusters, with cloud, with a with cloud, why should I worry about the speed on a single computer? I need to figure out how, once I figure out how to scale my application on a cluster, then the speed is not a limit at all. And Python can scale, easy to scale. We are not going to talk about that. If you are interested, you go to our HPC, High Performance Computing Python Workshop at RCC. Probably we do it every year or every semester, depending on how many people are interested. Here are the Python official documents, other resources, 
after today's lecture, don't worry about those coding if you get confused. So if you want to learn more, here is the Python official documentation. My only comp complaint about this official documentation is uh, it's too complicated and uh, too big. Then it's too hard to read. It, you cannot expect you read from the first line to the end. It's going to take forever. So if you are a new user, do not try to start from here because you are, you are quickly jumping into fire. It's too, too big documentation, okay? Watch some YouTube lectures first. There are many lecture series on YouTube. That's why I do, I do not want to spend too much time doing coding because those guys can do a way better job than me. Watch some YouTube lecture first. Then if you want to read some textbook, textbook is slightly nicer than, than this, okay? For example, learning Python, Python cookbook, and a foreign Python. I believe these are the highly ranked one on Amazon shopping site, okay? And uh, other web resources, uh, there's a realpython.com. They, 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 they post a blog-like articles, show you all kinds of fancy tricks, and also Python challenges. They, they post questions want you to solve it using Python. So this is uh, what my colleague recommended to me. I, I didn't really get uh, deep into it, but I think this is a good one you, you code. This is the one you read, read and watch. And uh, when you really want to become a professional programmer, sooner or later you realize you have to read the documentation. Then you have to go here to read their documentation. Okay, that's all I want to say for today, and I thank you for coming.